Uh, Jonathan Kim is here from Rethink Reviews. We're going to be reviewing Dead Man. That's an old school movie a little bit. What, do you, what year? 1995. Uh, 1995. At this point, that's old school and that is depressing. <laughs> okay, so let's watch the review and then we're going to tell you amazing facts about black cowboys and buffaloes. Here we go. Good morning. May you serve the Lord. And may his holy dominion guide you through your dismal life. How can I be of assistance, my poor man? All our ammunition is guaranteed. This latest batch was in fact personally blessed by the Archbishop of Detroit. Good morning. Now, Lord Jesus Christ, wash this earth with his holy light and purge its darkest places from heathens and Philistines. The vision of Christ that thou dost see is my vision's greatest enemy. Before becoming one of the biggest superstars on the planet, Johnny Depp was known primarily for making quirky, interesting films that didn't make much money. One of the quirkiest and one of my favorite movies of all time is Dead Man, released in 1995 and written and directed by Jim Jarmusch. Set in the Wild West, Depp plays William Blake, an accountant who leaves his broken life in Cleveland to take a job at the end of the line in a frontier town called Machine. But after killing the son of a powerful businessman in self-defense and getting badly wounded, Blake becomes a fugitive from the law, stumbling out into the wilderness where he meets an American Indian named Nobody, who believes Blake is the reincarnation of the 18th century poet and artist William Blake, and vows to return Blake to the land of the dead where he belongs. Not only is Dead Man my favorite Johnny Depp movie, but it also represents a redefinition, and in some ways a repudiation, of the modern Western. Shot in beautiful black and white with a searing score by Neil Young, Dead Man takes you to an Old West unlike any you've ever seen, yet is, in many ways, more accurate than we would probably like to think. In Jarmusch's West, you won't see a lot of cute settler towns full of God-fearing, law-abiding families staking their claim to a new and better life. As Dead Man shows, the Wild West was a place for the tough and brutal, where murderers and psychopaths could thrive unencumbered by the law or society. This is best exemplified by the three bounty hunters sent to track down Blake, played by Lance Henriksen, Michael Wincott, and Eugene Bird. Gary Farmer plays Nobody, the Indian who discovers the wounded Blake and has quite a story of his own. Kidnapped as a child by the British and sent to England as a Turing curiosity, nobody learned English and was only able to preserve his sanity through the poetry and art of William Blake. But after escaping from captivity and returning home, nobody's tribe refused to believe his stories about the approaching flood of white people and cast him out to walk the earth alone, a true nobody. Naturally, nobody's enmity towards white people runs deep and is frequently on display as was probably the case for most Indians, who saw white people break every treaty and wage war on their families and way of life. So nobody is overjoyed to learn that the white man he most admires, William Blake, has returned as a killer of white men, in nobody's minds, the best thing he could possibly be. As nobody takes Blake on their journey to the land of the dead, they encounter various people who again challenge Old West archetypes. There's a group of murderous gay rapists, played by Jared Harris, Billy Bob Thornton, and Iggy Pop, as well as a missionary played by Alfred Molina, who can hardly contain his Christian hatred for the heathenous Indians. The journey also takes them to the Pacific Northwest, a place rarely seen in Westerns, where we see the village of a Northwest tribe, once considered to be among the most advanced civilizations on the planet, as it's being decimated by diseases inflicted on them by white people in one of the earliest instances of biological warfare. While Johnny Depp's star really took off after the Pirates of the Caribbean, I still think Dead Man is the best movie he's been in and the best performance he's delivered, full of pathos and humor as Blake spars with nobody and slowly, reluctantly transforms into one of the most enduring of Old West archetypes, the gunslinging outlaw, as he sheds more and more of his previous self, embraces his new persona, and travels deeper into the wild. But Dead Man is also great for its decidedly unromanticized look at the Wild West, which wasn't called wild for nothing, where racism, lawlessness, and murder were part of the landscape, where Indians and white people really, really didn't get along, and where a young America was being forged throughout the West, not just in the deserts. At the same time, Dead Man is beautiful to watch, poetic in its spareness, and with a story that unexpectedly winds its way back to where it was always meant to go. If you like Westerns, Johnny Depp, or just want to see one of the best films of the 90s, Dead Man is definitely worth checking out. I'm Jonathan Kim, and this is a Rethink Review. Man, you were high on that movie, John. I really like that movie. Why did you uh, see it first? I think I saw it on video first. I didn't see it in in the theaters. 
but it's been a while since you've seen it. The first time. I mean, you, you've known oh. you've liked it for a while. That's yeah, yeah, and I, and I recently watched it again. So. Right. Okay, all right. Black and white. Eh, it can be a little pretentious. The dude's name is Nobody. That. Uh, yeah. Well, the, the idea behind the story, yeah, is that he, when he told uh, his tribe what had happened to him and that all these white people are coming, they, they gave him the name, the name uh, He Who Speaks Loud and Says Nothing. And uh -huh. he decided, well, nobody sounds a little bit better, so he goes with that. <laughs> okay. All right. You know, you got me to, to, to want to check it out, even though it seems a little artsy. You know, it is a, artsy. You know, I'm, I'm a bit of a knucklehead. So, All right. So uh, now let's get into the interesting facts. Um, uh, what did we do with those? You know what? Actually, before I get into these, the Wild West stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have this heroic image of our, like, oh, trailblazers going into the West. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, these were generally, like, the most vicious psychopaths we could find. I think a lot of them were. I mean, there <laughs> yeah, were I mean, am I overstating it? Probably. I think there were people who couldn't fit into regular society or had screwed up their life so bad where they were before <laughs> that they're like, I can't be here well, anymore. There, there were vast swaths, swaths of, um, <laughs> you know, significant lawlessness. So, I mean, if you were a bad guy, you could really sort of, if you were tough, you could sort of handle things yourself. I mean, even when there was the law, you know, it's really hard for them to get anywhere, catch anyone. And if they did catch you, Probably break out. <laughs> well, that's at least what we see from the movies. But certainly there was that element of lawlessness. Obviously, yeah. that's going to attract people who are interested in lawlessness. I mean, Deadwood, right. the show Deadwood, I mean, it's not an accident. I mean, that's, that's what Deadwood was. Right. And it's fascinating stuff, man. It is. And so it, it's also part of our culture. It's part of what this country is. I mean, there's a great part of this country. And, you know, a lot of the things that happen in the West are questionable. You know, and it just makes conservatives' heads explode, of course. Like, oh, look at these wimp libs. And that's how we conquered this country, by giving the Indians smallpox. Okay, but actually it turns out maybe not. Tell me about the smallpox thing. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it's become sort of accepted that, that giving Indians, uh, you know, blankets infected with smallpox was a, a common thing, was used basically as early biological warfare. But I was looking around, and in terms of it actually being a, a policy used by the military, there really isn't much evidence that that was an official policy. The one example that kept on coming up was um, there was a siege of Fort Pitt by, uh, by Delaware Indians. And this was during the... Um, during the French Indian War, and these two British uh, officers talked explicitly. They wrote in letters about um, about giving Indians smallpox blankets. In in one of the letters, said, "I will try to inoculate the Indians by means of blankets that may fall on their hands, taking care, however, not to get the disease myself." Um, let's see. So th those were British uh, soldiers giving it to the Native Americans in, in that particular area in Delaware. Yeah, and, oh, and basically we're saying that they that they that, that this was sort of an emergency measure and, and that they thought that this would kill them. But from what I was reading, that smallpox was spreading so fast that they didn't really need that much help spreading it. And also that the, the Indian war parties were taking, you know, clothes and objects and sometimes scalps, which would be even, you know, really bad because they'd get blood and, you know, other bodily fluids and stuff that could transmit the disease faster. Um, and also there was still trading going on, especially the, um, the buffalo pelt trading was a really big deal. And so even though apparently some of the trading posts told the Indians to stay away from the trading posts, but they would keep on doing it because it was, I think, the only way that they could get supplies or get what they needed. Um, but the, the number of, of Indians that were killed by disease, they were saying in some areas around 90% of the population might have been killed by smallpox and flu, mumps, yellow fever, tuberculosis, cholera, plague. That's interesting that it was not necessarily as coordinated a strategy as we were all <laughs> led to believe. Uh, but, you How know, could it be a coordinated strategy? Like handing out blankets? No, of course it can. You know, they just like they they did in that fort. They say, hey, you know what? This is a good idea. We yeah, but we spread a little bit of disease, and we yeah, and they do that in two. Th I, I, I don't mean, know. like coordinated. I mean, it, it happens a half a dozen times. You know, right, right, right. I never bought it. I mean, and, oh, and really? Jonathan stuff backs that up. That it wasn't. Yeah, I mean, in individual cases, but I mean, you ninety percent wiped out, but not just from smallpox. Yeah, I from, mean, we we brought diseases to people with no immune system to fight these diseases, and it killed them. Right. The other thing I got out of that is that, look, you know, when you look back at, at it from our perspective, obviously the, the, the settlers were the bad guys because they'd come into uh, an area that was already inhabited by Native Americans, and they'd largely kill them, right? right. So that, that kind of makes you the bad guy. But uh, what, you, what I could never understand when I was younger is, why do they hate the Indians so much, right? I mean, look, what the Indians ever do to them, right? But the reality is, it doesn't matter who started it. Once you got a war on your hands, those guys are coming to kill you, 
you got to kill them, right? Right. So as I, you tell me the story of this fort being, you know, siege. There's a siege by the Native Americans. They do the smallpox thing because they're like, otherwise we're going to die. Right. right? Yeah. These guys are going to kill and, us. And also we see in war all the time, you destroy infrastructure, you destroy bridges, you know, water treatment plants, you know, like sanitation also, plants, and, you know, like, that's done. And Talk regarding about. settlers, the settlers frequently were marginally unprotected or protected by a gunman or two, you know. Uh, they weren't warriors. They were literally settlers. And the Indians were warriors and knew how to attack and, and they'd come in and attack and it's not made up and so yeah, they're, boy, they'd kill the settlers and they'd scout them and they'd rape the women and they'd go about their business. So you're right, yeah, we started it but that still happened and you're gonna wanna just fight back in some way. Right, yeah. and w one last note on that is, look guys, you know, we see, we see funny things like, and I say it all the time, like, the way, we just, started Just real quick, from the rape point of view, I, I, I suspect there was some the other way also. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, maybe just a couple of times. Yeah. Right. So we say we started like, but at this point, what America is, and you know, it's, you know, it gets enmeshed in politics, and it's yeah. silly, right? But you know, your parents, your yeah. you know lineage came much later. Mine did, yours did, etc. And so we're just as much Native American as we are settlers. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, the, with the whole country is all one mix. So that's why I have. Uh, I'm amused when conservatives are like, "Oh yeah, these libs, they hate the settlers." No, I don't hate the settlers. I mean, I get it, and that's how the country was formed. Obviously, there were some bad things that happened, right? Yeah, it's just part of the history. Right. It's a, and know. but my question is, why can't you relate with the Native Americans? They were also Americans, right? right. Obviously, right. This was the Europeans' worst illegal immigrants ever. <laughs> I mean, they yeah. could. I mean, really taking over the whole country and kicking them off their land and having them sign treaties and breaking them, you know, things like that. I mean, you want to talk about illegal immigrants, right? That, because Wrecking, it, ruining the healthcare system. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's go to Jr.'s old uh, projection point, which is my favorite point of all time. He says, "Whatever conservatives say, they're projecting, right? It's exactly what they th want to do to you, right? So when you look at the, what they say about illegal immigrants, oh, they're bringing over disease and they're violent." And they're taking over our territory. It's it's exactly how this country was formed, right? right yeah. So yeah. until we start putting white people on reservations, I mean, really, like there can't be that much complaints. But so someday, someday, <laughs> <laughs> we'll show. See, them. see, that's what they're afraid of. All right. So t tell me about black cowboys. Uh, that there were a lot more of them than um, than I had really thought. It's saying that about a quarter of all cowboys were black. And about a third of them were either um, of black or, or, uh, or Hispanic uh, descent. And that basically there were a lot of freed slaves and they were concerned that they could get more of a, more of a fair shake um, yeah, out in the West. Right. And where it was really more about, you know, if you can do the job. And they're also saying that, that a lot of the um, of former slaves, they came, their families came from places in Africa that had cattle. So they actually were, knew a little bit about that, or at least was somewhere in their family lineage. But in this one, one thing that I read, it said, you know, they were treated pretty fairly on the, on the range as long as they weren't made foreman or trail boss over white men. Right, of course, you can't get rid of that, right? And, <laughs> yeah, and they, couldn't, what, they couldn't sit on the same end of the bar as white people? Yeah, they're saying that, like, that once they kind of got off the range and everything and, and were in the towns, that uh, saloon owners uh, would make them sit at one end of the bar, they couldn't solicit white prostitutes, and they were often called derogatory names. Yeah. Well, well probably be every now and then. saw that in Deadwood. You know, yeah. uh, the, uh, what's, uh, what they failed to mention is that uh, former uh, Dodger scout Al Campanis uh, once said that the blacks make excellent cowboys, but they don't have the leadership capabilities to be foremen. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now th it's interesting, though, that y you know both of you guys made that point. Look, in the West, you're interested in survival, right? Because it's such a tough place, etc. And if this guy can help you survive, I mean, okay, you don't make him foreman because the whole country is so unbelievably racist that they can't get beyond it. But they're like, oh, but I could use his help, exactly. right? <laughs> So that, that's an interesting phenomenon. And finally, about the buffaloes. If you thought we messed up the Native Americans, wait till you get a load of what we did Before to the buffaloes. Before we buffaloes, real quick, a terrific uh, 1960 uh, John, Ford, John Ford film with uh, Woody Strode, who was in so many uh, of his movies. He was like the, the black member of John Ford's uh, stock company. Uh, but uh, Sergeant Rutledge, uh, Woody Strode, actually the star, and it was certainly the first time we'd seen a, a buffalo soldier. We'd seen a black cowboy as the star of a movie. Yeah. And it's, good, it's a good movie. It's worth, it's worth watching. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, in terms of the buffalo, that actually was a government policy to kill as many buffalo as possible to basically cut off uh, the Indians' way of life and their food supply. Uh, 1.5 million were killed for their, for their pelts between 1872 and 73. Um, they, they had buffalo killing contests where the one guy, uh, Kansas guy, killed 120 bison in 40 minutes. 
Um, there Jesus. were there were tourist trips where people would shoot would shoot the buffalo out of out of the train windows, which actually they are, <laughs> out of helicopters. Um, <laughs> but that would later come in, 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 in the be, in the beginning of the of the movie. Uh, Johnny Depp is on a train from Cleveland, and at one point, all these trappers and hunters just go to the window and just start shooting out out, out of the window. But uh, but yeah, the one general said uh, that buffalo hunters quote did more to defeat the Indian nations in a few years than soldiers did in fifty. And uh, yeah, Buffalo Bill Cody earned his name by uh, by killing about 4,300 bison in eight months. So, you know, I, if this is my naivete, I, I didn't know that they had killed a buffalo to screw the Indians. I, I you know, I just never, like, I never knew Why that. did you think they killed the buffalo? I didn't know. I thought they were so much buffalo, they ate it, they didn't care, they were, you know, idiots. <laughs> they, they killed a lot of them of right, just trains. for the, the hides got to be very popular in fashion, and they, a lot of that was getting sent to the East Coast. But, I mean, they were still killing, you know, this enormous animal just for the fur. <laughs> So, uh -huh. whereas the Indians were, even in the midst of there being like 50 to 100 to 200 million bison around, they weren't killing them like crazy like the Indians were. They were killing a few and using every single part of it, and even with all this plenty, and it was such a part of their, uh, a part of their culture. And actually, that, that term we're talking about buffalo soldiers, that w there were um, a few black regiments that were fighting the Indians, and the Indians respected them so much, they gave them that nickname, Buffalo Soldiers. Oh, is that oh, right? Really? Yeah, yeah because in, in, in Buffalo, which was much revered in their culture, but oh, they respected right, right, them right, right. so much that's that that's why that, they gave yeah. them that nickname. Oh. Huh, you see that? You do Rethink Reviews, you learn a, a bunch of things. Fascinating. <laughs> All right, check out Rethink Reviews on YouTube, Huffington Post, and RethinkReviews.net. As always, pleasure, John. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having me. Thanks. All right.